Lisa Silverman, and I am in Portland, Maine. This is my lovely assistant, Nicole. Hi. <laughs> She's going to help with behind the scenes work and, and video stuff. Um, yeah, it was so great to hear Jamie. Um, I don't know if I've met him in person, but definitely over the last however many years Facebook's been happening, we've been friends. And I agree with Clara, his stories recently have been really, really beautiful. Um, I'm glad to be here this morning teaching about seaweed. It seems like you guys, I'm speaking to the choir here. Is there anybody um, new to macrobiotics in this group? Do you think, Gana? I don't know. I'll let me look through. And of course, different levels of macrobiotics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it looks like you're raising your hand in your picture over there. <laughs> yeah, your hand up in your... That's funny. <laughs> I just got, I'm sorry, I just got a, a bunch of seaweed from Maine of stuff oh, I don't, Mark? I'm not familiar, yeah, I'm not familiar with all the stuff that he has. So, uh -huh. I'll let him more stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. I have some seaweed from March too. It comes in these big bags. Yeah, huge, huge. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Dolls. I have dolls. <laughs> I have wakame or alaria and some digitata, which is kelp. And um, Gannat wanted me to focus on things that you can get more easily in Israel, but I think there are people from other places here also. So the menu today is we're going to do a baked wakame casserole with onions and squash, and we're going to do a strudel. Um, traditionally, it's a hiziki strudel, but I guess it's easier for you to get arame. Um, and then we're going to do rice pockets, which is similar to a nori roll, but for me and Nicole, <laughs> we love our rice pockets. There's something like we crave and we just make little, put anything in them. And I'll show you those really quick too, um, towards the end, but it's like a nori roll or a, you know, the, um, triangles that you make sometimes it's like those but it's different you just we just like make a little envelope and eat them up so it's not about pretty it's just about getting everything in the seaweed and munching so those are really fun um and for those of you you know the benefits of seaweed are incredible there's actually some stuff out here right now about covid and seaweed and that it's can help if you've already gotten COVID, but also can help be a preventative because um, of all the great nutrients and especially the iodine in seaweed. And so, you know, it's never good to eat too much of anything. In macrobiotics, we say everything in moderation. And seaweed, if you look at that wheel, you know, that we used to put out the macrobiotic wheel, seaweed is like five or 10% in there, or beans and seaweed, it's, it's a smaller percent doesn't mean it's any less important than all the other things on the wheel. It just means, you know, we don't want too much minerals because what happens when you get too much minerals is you get too yang and then all you want is sweets. So um, macrobiotics is a uh, seaweed or so it's an important part and it makes us different than a lot of other like vegan or vegetarian or, you know, all these different fad diets that have come up like they don't necessarily include seaweed or the fermented foods that we do. And um, it's a really important part of your hair and your nails and your, um, you know, they say it can help with weight loss. I, I, I say that the nutrient dense foods, what happens a lot, I, I work in the addiction field. Um, and a lot of people who are, you know, healing from heroin and all other kinds of things, and they have a drug, you've all probably heard of methadone, but there's other drugs like Suboxone that, that fill in the receptors for that drug. So they're not getting high from it anymore, but they're not craving it anymore. And I feel like seaweed fills in the receptors for hunger because a lot of times we're overfed and undernourished and we crave things that actually take our minerals away instead of focus on things that give us our minerals. And so if we're eating any kind of sugary things or refined foods or a lot of flour products or um, empty things, it actually, it's not only not a nutrient, it's a non-nutrient. It takes nutrients and a lot of different minerals from our body, demineralizes our body. And so 
um, it's important to have a good base of minerals and kind of like, um, I remember you guys know Jessica Porter. She's been there a bunch of times. She's one of my best friends. Um, she used to say, it's like, if true North is a huge magnet and that's your destiny, you know, when you're mineralized enough, it's almost like you're pulled to your true North. You're magnetized to what your life purpose is, what you're, um, supposed to be doing in life. And a lot of times when we have things that are more, make us wishy-washy or, you know, eating refined things or sugary things, and we can't make any decisions, we're just sort of like lost. Um, you know, that's, that's the opposite. We're like, we can't, we, we can't sort of get out of our own way to see what our true North is anymore. And so um, making sure that we're getting a good mineral base and a good way to do that is adding sea vegetables to your diet. Um, and so I've heard that the ones that you can get mostly in Israel are wakame. And the other one is arame and kelp. Are those the three that you can get mostly? Yes, Claire. Um, Haziki also is hard to find nori. everywhere. Go ahead. And nori. Oh, and nori. Great. And I am doing nori. So yeah, I'm using nori. I am using Arame, and I am using um, wakame. So if, there's a couple of ways you can get wakame. We're gonna start with this um, baked dish because it takes longer. I've, I've been cooking all morning, so everything is actually all done, but I'm gonna demonstrate what I've done. And I'm gonna be like Julia Childs, like here, Nicole, she's gonna put it in the oven. And I'm gonna like, Ta -da! it's all done. So, you know. I'll try to do my best. I don't have the the uh, accent or whatever she has, but. <laughs> oh yes, you have to speak like this. Oh yes, I have to speak like this. Oh, and maybe yes. I get Nicole to speak with me. Um, so the first dish. Now you can find these recipes. Um, I can send them to Ganat, but I don't really use recipes much. Um, a lot of these things like the casserole, I learned in my first macrobiotic class at the Cushy Institute, um, probably with Carrie Wolf or Diana Voli. And they had this whole thing about not having any um, recipes. They would just show you how to do it and that was it. And they give you a list of ingredients and they wouldn't really do anything else. And then um, Jessica did put this, Jessica Porter put the wakame uh, casserole in her book, The Hip Chick's Guide to Macrobiotics. And I did do the test kitchen for that book many years ago when it first came out. Before it came out, we went through all the dishes and made sure that the recipes were, were right. And um, so she put this recipe in there. And then Christina Perello in her book, Cooking the Macrobiotic Way or whatever, it's one of her first cook cookbooks. Um, she did Jim's Haziki Strudel in there. And um, I've sort of taken the strudel part and made it gluten-free and I've used coconut oil. Oy, you don't have to, but it makes a really good dough. And it's all Jamie's fault because the other day he made an apple strudel with quinoa flour and coconut oil. I'm like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So that's what I've used, but you can also substitute a safflower oil um, Christina Perello loves to cook with an avocado oil. Um, you know, you just don't want to use lard. <laughs> no Crisco. <laughs> but it's funny because coconut oil, it really does. It does a nice job for a crust. And so we're, let's go. I mean, I'm going to go, you know, to basics about like cutting an onion. This beautiful onion is from our local farmer's market, Gorenson Farm. It's really, really um, one of my favorite places to get stuff. And so let's see, I'm gonna show you my cutting board now. I have my NHS knife, which I've had since I went to the Cushy Institute almost 30 years ago. It's really um, outlasted a lot of things, keep it nice and sharp. So you'll notice you have a root end and the top end. We like to cut it from root to top. So if you cut it lengthwise, 
Okay, and then you just cut a little bit off the top. I don't cut the bottom, I leave that there to hold it together. And then I'm just taking out the outer skin. I have a nice compost program here called Garbage to Garden, where they do curbside compost and then they give you compost at the in the springtime, which is really helpful in the city in Portland. And then now I remember Mark Hanna. I cooked at a macrobiotic summer conference um, oh, when it was in Vermont many, many years ago. And he was the one that really taught me how to do onions. I'd been to a regular traditional cooking school, but he showed me, you know, if you keep this little root part intact and when you cut it, let me go down, you don't cut all the way to the end. You just sort of cut down like this. Right, and then if you were to do a dice from here, this is all held together. It's not gonna go anywhere. It's safer for your hands. And maybe you do a cut this way and then you dice down. But we're just doing it, we're just actually doing it like this for our dish. And so for this purpose, I just cut off the root and then cut all the way down. Okay, and I'm going to give this to Nicole. What she's going to do is just simmer the onions for about five minutes to soften them to go in our casserole. Okay, so she is going to take them and simmer them on the stove with just a little water and a pinch of salt, just to take out the sharpness and soften them some so that when they bake, it's an easier bake. The other way you could do it is caramelize them if you want them a little bit sweeter. Um, if anybody knows how to caramelize onions, you're basically want to burn them a little bit even. You heat up your pan. You always want to, I'm going to start crying now from those onions. <laughs> I work a lot at the um, Kripalu Center. If anybody's heard of that, it's in uh, Western Massachusetts and I assist the chef there. And he always says, it isn't a Kripalu program if you don't cry. And we have, you know, 30 stations set up and everybody's learning how to cut their onions and everybody's bawling because we're cutting up onions all together. Um, but anyway, you could caramelize your onions first if you really wanted to take it to the next level of sweetness. We're just, we're just like kind of cooking them for five minutes to just take out the hardness and so that when it's in the casserole and in the oven, it's gonna cook more. Um, I've soaked my wakame here. Um, you can get wakame already. Has everybody seen this? Where it's like the wakame pieces where you can get it and then you reconstitute it. You don't have to take out the spine or anything. It's really quick for miso soup and stuff. Or you can go to our friend Larch or get it in its whole form. This is called Alaria as opposed to wakame. And this one, it does have a little stem in it. Can you see the stem right there? A lot of times when you reconstitute it, if you're getting it from Japan or something, which a lot of people don't want to right now because of the um, <clears throat> spillage of all kinds of stuff. But if you get it, the, the spine is really, really thick. And so what we usually do is reconstitute it, cut out the spine and then cut up the little pieces after it's been soaking for a while. Um, but with this Alaria from Maine, the spine is just so small and delicate. It's not like tough, like the one from Japan. And so it's really easy to eat it. And, and, and you know, good for your spine. I mean, you don't wanna get rid of the spine. It, you know, it supports your whole system and, you know, one of the other benefits from seaweeds are, is that it helps sort of release some heavy metals from your body and it also helps with radiation. All right, is there anybody here that is not exposed to radiation every day? We're getting exposed right now, <laughs> sitting in front of our computer. Remember your parents used to say, six feet away from the TV. And now we have these screens like right up to our faces. So, um, to protect us from this kind of radiation too. You know, a little bit of seaweed every day is really important. So we've already reconstituted our seaweed and we're boiling the onions. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put that all in 
you know, some little casserole dish. Um, if you have the kind that has a lid, that's the better kind. You know what I mean? I, I made it earlier with my one with the lid, but I'll show you afterwards. Otherwise, I mean, tinfoil is not the greatest thing, but if you can find some kind of way to cover your thing for the first 30 minutes when you put this in the oven, you want it covered. And then you take the cover off for the last 15 minutes. And so it's better to have some kind of um, casserole like a pyrexing with the actual lid. It makes it so much easier. You put it all in with the lid, you take the lid off and you cook it for the last 15 minutes. So what we're gonna do is when the onions are done, we're gonna layer that with our wakame and we're gonna use a little bit of the wakame soaking water in there. And then we are going to add some butternut squash. That was the other thing. Um, Ganat said that it's easier for you to get butternut, but maybe not delicata or a kabocha. Are those things harder to get for some of you? Yes. So I do have a butternut squash, a really nice one from that same farm. It's organic. I'm not gonna take the skin off. You can if you don't like it or if it doesn't, it's not organic. Um, for this dish, I'm gonna give this to you. For this dish, you really want like thin slices. I think I'm gonna do quarter moons. And so I'm just gonna do like little thin It was a full moon last night. Everybody saw the full moon, I hope. I watched it rise. The Halloween, I guess maybe we don't, we don't um, celebrate Halloween in Israel, most likely, right? But I was in Israel last, a year ago, May, with my mom for the very first time. And it was very exciting, although I went with a bunch of older people and we either went to the dairy restaurant or we went to the meat restaurant. And so I was stuck with eating hummus every day because <laughs> we didn't, I was like, can't we go to the vegan restaurants? Which I guess, you know, there's tons of them in Tel Aviv and so forth, but they weren't into that. So I ended up eating a lot of hummus and some falafel. So I'm just cutting my squash pretty thin. pretty thin to go on top of our casserole and it's just going to cook right in there nice okay One of the things that I always liked about um, cooking classes at the Kushi Institute, I went to the Kushi Institute in maybe 1990. And then I went to the International Macrobiotic Institute in Quintal, Switzerland um, in 1992 or three for my next levels. And I found I learned more from the cooking teachers than I did from all the other things because they talked about so many things as they were cooking, you know, so I learned little tidbits about how they were parenting and how they helped their kids eat better. And I don't know, it was just always inspiring to be at a cooking class with Diana Voli, who had like eight kids or Wendy Esco, who had seven kids. Thank you. You're not. Wendy Esco had, how many did Wendy have? Hmm. Hard telling. She doesn't know that one, but you know that Diane had seven and Wendy had a lot of kids. I met a lot of the ESCO kids. Um, anyway, you know, and you would learn about women things. I mean, you learn about so much from the cooking teachers. It was great. So we're just waiting for our onions. What do you think it's been five minutes? It's just that they're wanting to be a little bit soft. Just a little soft? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So our onions are coming. We're just gonna put them in the bottom here. Yeah, you can put it here and I'll put it. Everybody needs a Nicole in their house. <laughs> um, at the Kushi Institute, there used to be our favorite assistant. His name was Tony and he was a retired cop from Brooklyn. And I remember my friend Allison and I went to his class and she goes, I want a Tony. And then she goes, can I be your Tony, Lisa? That was very cute. So our onions are, they're soft, see? They're, they've softened up some. 
We've got our onions. I'm gonna take some of this water here um, and dissolve our tahini. So Warren Kramer, you guys know him, right? His favorite tahini. Now I imagine you guys have amazing tahini in Israel. I can't imagine you wouldn't because that's true. But his favorite tahini is this Toham tahini. Oh yeah, and, Betty Minkin. Sure. Yeah, he loves this type. And I found it at Whole Foods the other day. It's expensive, more than you know, the one that you find in the plastic bottle that's still organic, but it's a really, really lovely flavor. And what we're gonna do is take, this is hot, yeah. um, take some of this water. It says, you know, two tablespoons of tahini with like a quarter of a cup of water or so. So we're using our, a little bit of the cooking water from the onions. I mean, some people say discard the, oh, so, discard the wakame, you know, the seaweed cooking water. Other people say use it. There's a lot of good benefits in it. You don't want to use a lot of it, right? Because you don't want it too salty. But we're just going to use a little bit of the wakame water. And we've got the wakame here. We're putting that in. Da, da, da. Okay, and then I'm going to whisk in the tahini. Wakame are you using? I am using this type. Okay. Um, but how much of it? Oh, I don't know. In the recipe, it says since I don't follow recipes. Um, but in that recipe, let's see, cancel notes. You know, when they update your phone and then you can't find anything, I hate that. Okay, so I'm gonna read the recipe too so you can take some notes. Two cups of onions in half moons, one cup of wakame soaked, two tablespoons of tahini, one teaspoon of shoyu and a half of a small butternut squash. Okay, so that's the recipe. And I'm going to email it. Well, afterwards I'll email it to Ganat so that she could either get it to you in, your, in the chat box or something like that. All right, so I'm gonna take the tahini, two big tablespoons, a little bit more. And then a little bit of show you. I got the Osawa. Show you. And then a whisk. And I'm gonna layer on, you know, it's nice to make it pretty. So if you put on your squash on top, in the recipe it says to put the tahini on before the squash, but then your squash doesn't have any of the flavor of the tahini. So I like to pour it all on top after I get my squash all pretty. So, you know, get creative. Um, we eat with our eyes first. Uh, when I used to cook for people, I also cook for people like Jamie and, um, I used to make mandalas for people. Like the, every plate would be like a mandala. So the salads or everything would be. And so I would try to organize, like when you look at, you know, the nine star key and you have, you know, the liver, the heart, the spleen, the intestines and the kidneys, that's only half of the groups. But, you know, I would just put stuff in the plate and my intention would be, may this heal those organ systems in each part of the mandala. And I would say kind of a prayer for the people. And, you know, whenever I'm cooking for anybody, I, I do a mantra. Um, it's more of a Sanskrit mantra. It's a great healing mantra called Om Shri Davantre Namaha. Om Shri Davantre Namaha. 
and it calls on all the healing elements um, for the people and infuses the food with beautiful healing. And But you can make up your own things like, may everybody who eats this, may they be peaceful. May I be peaceful as I'm cooking. May I be free of suffering. May I put love into the food. May they feel so nourished and loved by eating this food that a small amount is enough. The right amount is enough. So putting your intention into the food and adding love, it's the most important part. If you look at, you know, Aveline Cushy's original cookbook there, she talked a lot about um, the different parts of cooking and most of it being attitude and like being in your hara as you chop and really getting your energy, your key should be really strong as you're cooking. And so making sure that you're, you know, doing doin daily and getting up your own energy because you're the one putting healing into the food. That's, that's the most important ingredient right there is the healing. Okay. So, so this is what it looks like. And then we're going to put the tahini sauce on the top. We're going to cover it and bake it for 30 minutes and then take the cover off and bake it for another 15. And you can put the cover on, put the cover on top and make sure that. And then after 45 minutes, it's finished. So this one has a lid, so it's really nice. You take off the lid and this is delicata squash because I, this is my favorite squash. But this is the finished product and it's sweet and delicious and the you want the liquid to cook out so it dries out some um so and you can also put some toasted sesame seeds on top as a garnish which is really nice okay look at that we got one dish down all right our next thing so maybe we could take this away oh well we need this for the maybe we'll put this stuff in here Breathing. Breathing is important too. I'm also a breath worker <laughs> and I do um, transformational and therapeutic breath work with people. And, you know, the way we breathe um, affects everything in our life. It's the one thing that happens automatically and that we can also change. And so um, if you're feeling anxious, you know, if you check in with your breathing, you're probably only breathing here. And so to bring the breath down into your hara, to bring your energy down, you can, you know, move from that anxiety more into an embodied way of looking at things. Or if you do alternate and ultra breathing, you get out of that small mind, which is making a problem into the great mind, which is already know that everything is handled and that all will be well. Um, our next dish is going to be our strudel. So I've already made the dough. That's in the fridge. Um, I think that's too hard to do. Oh no, good. So I made the dough, and what I did is I used a combination of millet flour and quinoa flour. So it's gluten free. Um, I use coconut oil, a pinch of salt, and then if you're making more of a sweet type of a if you were making an apple strudel, you might want to add, you know, a little bit of maple or maple syrup or, or rice syrup or something if you wanted a sweet dough. Um, I also added a little arrowroot to it. So um, again, so let me read to you the ingredients and I can also send this. So for one recipe, it's the one and a quarter cups of gluten-free flour. You can also use wheat flour or you could use a combination of wheat and white if you want something lighter. But if you're gluten-free, I use the millet and quinoa. I use a cup of the millet and a half, I mean, a cup of the quinoa and a quarter cup of millet. Um, three tablespoons of arrowroot, a little bit of sea salt, and a third a cup of coconut oil. But you could use another oil if you prefer. Two tablespoons of maple syrup or some kind of sweetener if you want to make more of a sweet crust and three tablespoons of ice cold water. So I, what I did is I put everything in the food processor and zoop, whipped it up, add the water at the end and it's, and it's done like that. It was so, it's so easy.
But if you don't want the electric energy in your food, you want to do like a regular crust. You want to sort of fork in the coconut oil. So it's like pea sized pieces. And then you add the cold water until it makes a dough and then you make your dough for yourself. And so I'm gonna take a little bit of flour, put it down. On top. So I'm gonna roll it in between the parchment paper just cause it, and we wanna start with kind of a square or I mean a rectangle sort of thing. Cause we're, since we're making a strudel, we're not making a pie. We don't want it round. We want it in a rectangle. I'm gonna take another piece of parchment paper on top. This is compostable parchment paper, which is nice. Maybe you can move that out of the way. And then we're gonna roll it out. We're gonna roll it both ways. And we want it to be a good thinness. A little flour. Okay, so we're gonna put this aside for right now. And well, I'm gonna show you the assembly of this and then I'm gonna show you how to make the filling. I already made the filling because you want it to be cool when you add it to the dough, okay? You don't wanna put hot filling into the dough. So I'm just gonna show you like the rolling of the strudel and then I'm gonna show you how to make the filling, okay? But this is the filling here. And because I didn't have, they don't, they, right now we can't find Arame in stores. So I didn't have enough to make it twice. So I have, this is Hajiki. And it was actually given to me by this beautiful Japanese neighbor um, many years ago. She didn't know any English. She lived right next door to me. And we kind of would talk a little bit. And, and I looked at her one day and I said, macrobiotics? And she goes, Michio Kushin? <laughs> and she was my neighbor in Portland, Maine. And we became best friends and we figured out how to communicate together. And she helped me make tofu from scratch. We made miso together. Um, she moved back to Japan and she's passed away a few years ago, but she gave me all of her seaweeds when she left. So I have hajiki from before the arsenic days. So we have some really good hajiki here. Um, but I also got to show you with Arame. So this is the filling. It's um, sauteed onions, carrots, and I used a little bit of Japanese sweet potato. Just adds a little bit of sweetness. So I cut them all in matchsticks. And then I'm just gonna roll my dough. Like so, and you can, you know, some of you are really creative. Some of you are like, I just want it to taste good and I don't care, but you can make, you know, a little bit of striations on there. You can make a, a little bit of extra dough into your favorite macrobiotic teacher's face. <laughs> or you can make a sun or a moon. You know, like if you took a little extra piece of the dough and you could make a little crescent moon and bake that on top or something. Ta -da! I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do to dress it up. But for the most part, we do that and then we put it on a pan to go in the oven. And you can put it right on top of the parchment paper so it doesn't stick. And you go, voila. And then you bake it for about 25, 30 minutes. 
And when it's done, dun 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 dun. Oh, <laughs> it went for a dive, but it looks like so. And it's nice and big and beautiful. And the crust is delicious. Um, it's such an amazing way to kind of, like Jamie was saying that there are all these people who don't like beans. There are also people who don't like seaweed, right? I don't like the taste of seaweed, but this is a great way to help people like seaweed. And so the filling for the inside of that in the, I mean, is there anybody here who hasn't made a regular arame dish with just like, you haven't, Ellen. Okay, Ellen, this is for you. So what, what you wanna do is you wanna wash your vegetables you want to make some matchsticks. <clears throat> Where's my tea? <laughs> so <laughs> first lesson, um, I remember the first time that like, it probably was Carrie Wolf that said, this is where heaven and earth meets in the carrot, right? Your greens grow out the top and they meet here in the middle and then your root comes down. And so this is like the heart of the vegetables. Many people just cut it off. Um, but she would say to just dig around that sort of outside, get the dirt out. and leave that little nib on top intact. And it's just more about putting mindfulness into your food, right? Okay, I am in a healing space. I am making healing food. I'm gonna be mindful of the things that I'm working with. And I want this heart of the vegetable to be part of my dish. And so I'm gonna cut out the dirt around that top of the vegetable. Now you don't always have time to this. Like sometimes I cook for yoga retreats like um, Jamie was talking about, which is all stopped because of COVID. You know, and then I might just go, all right, I'm just gonna cut through these. But when I have time, I like to just cut off that, that sar and then leave it intact. And then we've already scrubbed this carrot. Did you grow this? No. Nicole did not grow this, but somebody in Maine grew this beautiful big carrot. And to do matchsticks, what you want to do is you want to cut on an angle. If you bend your fingers like so, you won't cut your fingers and use it as sort of a gauge. And you cut them very thin. How are we doing on time, Ganat? Oh, she's gone. She's abandoned ship. It's 20 of the hour. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. So we are cutting our carrot a nice diagonal. And then we're going to fan it out like so. Everybody see that? Fanning out the carrot. And then for the matchstick, then you come back down this way. Like so. So that's our carrots. We're going to do the same with the sweet potato. We'll probably peel it and then you would do the same thing with your sweet potato. And then the onions you'll do just as we showed for that other dish. This onion is beautiful. This is called a blush onion. It's not a red onion and it's not a white onion. It's a blush onion and it has these sort of pink undertones. That's maybe hard to see on the thing but it's kind of like this beautiful pink onion. I use that in the other dish. And so 
what we're going to do is we're going to take our onions and our carrots and our sweet potatoes. We're going to heat up the pan with a little bit of oil and we're going to saute them and add some water and simmer them for about 10 minutes. Um, on that, in another pan, you take your air may. This is what it looks like before you reconstitute it. It's all dried. You're going to reconstitute it for about 10 minutes. And then you're going to simmer that in water for about 10 minutes. And then you add the two together, saute them with some show you. You can add ginger to that. You could. Um, Mm. Oh, and, and you just want to cook the water out at the end and that's your filling. So that's, I'm not going to go into all the details about that, but if, in the recipe, it'll go into details that I send to Ganat. Um, but the basic thing is like getting your vegetables the right size, sauteing them. And when you cut in an angle like that, um, in macrobiotics way, they say you're cutting on the angle. So yin and yang, both parts of the energy of the vegetable are getting into each bite. If you want to get all up there. So the last thing we're going to show is the rice pockets. And then maybe we'll have time for questions. So this can all go. Maybe I'll save a couple of carrots. We can put them in the rice pocket. OK, so rice pockets. You don't need a nori mat. I'm just going to put it down so you can see. Um, when you buy nori, sometimes it says toasted. Sometimes it says it's not toasted. If you don't buy it toasted, you need to toast it. Um, and how you would do that if you have a gas stove is you take the sheet and you just sort of toast it over your open flame a little bit and it turns from a black to a green. Um, but if you can't do that, it's better to buy the toasted stuff for nori rolls, okay? Or for rice packets in this case. And just like when you're making nori rolls, there's a rough side and there's a shiny side. You wanna put the rice on the rough side. And so we've got um, pressure cooked sweet brown rice and short grain brown rice is a mixture. It's like two thirds short grain brown rice and a third sweet brown rice. And you want to put it in the center so it's kind of like in a square. Depending on how much stuff you want to put in, you don't need a ton. So you've got your rice, so you've got your brown rice, right? Your whole cereal grain. Now, we cooked up some tempeh. Um, basically, what I like to do is heat up a pan, put a little toasted sesame oil and brown the sides, and then simmer in a little water and soy sauce um, for like 10 or 15 minutes and cook out the water. So it's like um, digestible and, and a little bit salty and crispy. So we've got a little bit of tempeh. Um, I like to put some sprouts in there. We've got some spicy radish microgreens. Sprouts are really great in the springtime, but they're also great when you're feeling like you need a little springtime in your day. You're feeling stuck in the winter and you need something to enliven you. You need a little bit of upward fun energy. So, you know, a little bit of sprouts. Um, you put a little bit of umeboshi paste. I just like to put a dab of that in there, just like your old, um, I used to say that those little brown rice rolls that you make, just put a little spit in the center. The triangles and stuff you could keep for like a week when you're traveling or something. <laughs> It's always funny. And then you can put anything in here. We have some greens, actually. I have collard greens growing in my garden. We just cut these out and we blanch the little collard greens. I also have some lovely curly kale in my garden. And so we just boiled some water with just like a couple of grains of salt, simmered them and took them out. So 
not for a long time, just enough for the bright green to come out. Have you ever seen Denny Waxman cook greens? It's so that the nutrients come to the surface of the greens and they turn a bright, dark green. So we've got our light vegetable greens in here. And then just a teeny bit of tahini. And you could also put gamasio in here if you want a little something. Okay, so that's gamasio. So then for the rice packet, you fold one side, you get the other corners a little bit wet. You fold the other side, like an envelope, the other side, and then the top. And so it's just like a little rice pocket envelope. And then you eat it. So you can put anything in these. We're even gonna put in some of that squash dish that we made in the oven in here, which is gonna be really delicious. So this is a great thing to bring to work. Um, great thing for kids and it's delicious. So questions, comments? You didn't mention the temperature of the oven when you baked. 350. If you have a convention oven, you could like do it quicker. But. I find when I used to make kajiki strudel, I haven't mm. made it in years because I went gluten-free, but now I'm gonna use this recipe. How do you not overdose on that? I could eat the whole roll and it's not good to eat that much seaweed. That was one of my favorite dishes. You have to have a big party, which is hard in COVID right now, but you have to have enough people over so it gets all eaten one night and everybody only gets one serving. <laughs> but you know, I found it freezes very well. Mm. It freezes mm -hmm. well, so. Yeah. It is delicious, thank you. How much, seaweed, how much seaweed should you eat in a day? So how it works usually, um, so nori, you could have up to a quarter to a half a sheet of day of nori, and that will give you a lot of great stuff. So you can make one of these packets a day um, or at three times a week or something, and that will cover, cover some bases. The alaria um, or wakame, we usually use it in soup. So you reconstitute it and make it in your miso soup. It doesn't, you don't have a lot of it, but you're getting the whole essence of it in your soup. You know, the soup, the miso soup kind of recreates the atmosphere of the womb that you grew up in for the first nine months of your life, they say. Um, but you're getting the alkalinity of the miso and the seaweed. Um, so a little bit of that in your miso soup. Kombu, we usually use like a stamp size piece when we're cooking beans. Sometimes we make a vegetable dish of um, a dookie bean squash and kombu, and we might use like a two inch piece, but that's used in cooking regularly in different things that we're cooking, the kombu or kelp. And then the arame and the hajiki is really like once or twice a week. It's pretty concentrated. So if you have a little bit every day in something that you're making, then you're gonna get those nutrients um, so that your brain is saying, I'm not overfed and undernourished. I am nourished and I don't need to overfeed myself. Those are surprisingly small quantities. Yeah, you don't need a ton of it. You don't need a ton of it because it's so potent. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're having a half a sheet of nori every day, you're getting a lot out of that to begin with, but you're having a small amount in your seaweed like thing. Roll? Yeah, like a roll. Um, you're getting your, you know, daily in a miso soup, um, you know, like how much walk do we put in a miso soup? Like, you know, maybe a piece like this. Yeah, oh, uh, you put, Claire only puts this much. I put a little bit more. Um, and then, go ahead. I have a thyroid problem. And you have to be very careful with seaweed if you have an underactive thyroid. Can you hear me? No. Thyroid. Oh. Why You're not? just a little muffled. Try saying it again. Um, I have a. Th you have to be careful if you have a thyroid problem, as seaweed can do your thyroid in. 
Oh, and right. I would not have too much. I would not have it every day, especially right. if you have an underactive thyroid. Yes, DALT is supposed to be very good for the thyroid and a little bit of iodine. So it can just, overdo. You yeah, have to be very of, careful. So it's like it's sort of like a if you were a homeopath, you know, in homeopathy, they use a little bit of the poison to treat the the thing. And so, you know, using very small amounts is actually helping to balance it out. But yes, like you said, not too much. And it's in those cases, you know, you would like to see a macrobiotic counselor you could go into detail about oh, if you're hypo or hyper, and these are the best things to do with your seaweed doses. And it's great to find, you know, one of those people like Jamie or Warren Kramer, they would tell you exactly like the amounts, et cetera, for specific problems. But they actually help reduce the size of tumors and fatty cysts in the body, um, fibroids, all kinds of things, help to release the heavy metals. Yes, cannot. Are we done? Just about. What do you do with DELS? Oh, so, so many things. Um, if you have kids who don't like seaweed. Don't have kids. I mean, they're all grown up. They're all grown up. <laughs> Some people, I remember teaching a seaweed class at the Children's Museum for regular kids. You know what I mean? And you can hide it in like cream cheese on a bagel or something like real cream. You can do tofu cream cheese. But I like to make... Um, like a Waldorf salad with dulse, like apples and toasted um, walnuts and carrots and cabbage and just a little bit of reconstituted dulse. I like it in there like that. I also make a red cabbage dish with dulse. Sometimes I like to add a little bit of um, raisins or something like a sweet kind of red cabbage and dulse dish is really nice. Um, you can put it in soups or salads or it's more of like a like an add-on. And there's this smoke apple with dulse, which I sometimes could put in like tempeh tuna to add that little flavor of this, of the seaweed and the smoked flavor. I put it in my smoothies, although smoothies aren't very <laughs> macro, but. <laughs> Cole puts it in her smoothies and you know, you can get the shakeable one. The, the, they have them in the little shakers too. Well, what can I say? This has been amazing. I, it's so easy with you. I mean, we could just continue. It's just so smooth and I just appreciate it and you very much. Oh, so well, thank I'll you. I'll take the recipes, or at least the ones for yes. those two things that you could share Send with everybody. the recipes, right. And you yeah. guys can figure out the rice pockets pretty easy. You're all advanced. Yeah, yeah. So who knew? Yeah, that's really great. And it's great. Well, thank to you so much. Everybody. Good. Oh, and are there not? questions? Nobody asked me a question in the chat box, did they? Eden, welcome. I thought she said one cup. So yeah. Ba, ba, ba. Anyway, great, great okay, to see you, everybody. You. Thank class. you, thank you, thank you. It was. Hi, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye, Lisa. Take bye, care. Bye.